Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This is the second time I've recorded this video and this time I have double checked that the microphone has been recognized by the recording program so I won't look like I'm a bee buzzing around in the end of a tin like I did when I recorded it last time. Now I thought of the topic for this video from a couple of things. The first one is I have been looking at going back to my Russian army for a while. So I think I'm going to try and work on f completing my guard brigade with those. I also want to get some military order Karaziers done. You may or may not see me bringing the Russians to the event in Derby in June. For those of you who don't know, a Clash of Eagles is a Napoleonic Wargaming weekender being held at Boards and Swords in Derby, and it is happening on the 22nd and 23rd of June. It's not supposed to be a competitive event, it's just an opportunity for people to get together, bust out some games using 28mm Napoleonic figures, and all get together and have a good time. Because I know that sometimes organising and finding games can be a little difficult. If you want to know more, then you can either leave a comment down below or pop onto the Boards and Swords website and you'll be able to pick up tickets from there. You can also, I think, download the rules pack from there as well. There have been a few changes since it was made, just a very, very couple of minor tweaks. But uh, yeah, you can uh, download the rules pack from there as well. Now, because I have designed four scenarios for that event, it's it, it's usually best to try and playtest them. And we did that in the last battle report against General Dan. He was commanding his British, I was commanding his Austrians, and the, uh, the point of the battle was for one side to get off the table and the other side to try and stop them. Now, it was up to General Dan to try and get off the table, and he said that he thought it was a very difficult victory conditions for the army that are trying to get off the table. And while I agree with him to an extent, I don't think it's necessarily impossible. And the reason why is, I think, something that I've talked a lot about in the past, and that is aggression. How important it is to be aggressive on the battlefield. Now, that said, it does depend on what army you're running. The British, which General Dan was running, tend to do better in defence than they do in assault. But that doesn't mean that they're without their own teeth. An army such as the French, or yeah, maybe even the Russians, are a lot better on the offensive than perhaps the British are. So what I thought we'd look at in this video is when is it best to trade fire with the enemy? When is it best to get in and give them the cold steel? Or as the Russians would say, Thank you, Anna. We'll be hearing a lot more from you when we do our my um, Napoleonic figures video on Nadezda Drurova. But as she quite rightly said there, the bullet is a fool, the bayonet is a hero. Sometimes it's worth giving the cold steel, other times it's worth standing off and firing. So let's look into the the mechanics of both. Well, the vast majority of units, I'm going to talk about just medium-sized line units here, get three dice for shooting, six for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now there, straight off the bat, you can see that you get more from hand-to-hand, -hand, so it should be better to go to hand-to-hand, -hand, right? Well, not necessarily. There are bonuses that you get for firing that you don't necessarily get in hand-to-hand. -hand. So one of them, an obvious one, would be sharpshooter. This lets you re-roll one of your missed shots. Usually you'll find it in light infantry regiments, Jaegers, riflemen, things like that. But for the British and the French, they will have light infantry mixed in with their regular infantry battalions as well. So don't forget, if you are using particularly British light infantry, don't forget they've got that special rule. The French, it's a little bit easier to remember because they've got different trousers on. They've got blue trousers for the British. Just remember, if you've got that light infantry battalion in that brigade, they get to reroll one of their misses. And that's no small, no small feat. That reroll gives you a 33% re-rolling of your dice now there is a similar one for melee tough fighter anyone who's seen any of my videos knows certainly knows about tough fighter that's for sure and that allows you to re-roll one of your melee dice now because you are rolling on average 16 dice in melee and oh, that's 16 because you are rolling six dice in melee and only three from shooting a re-roll in shooting is worth twice as much as it is for melee so a melee re-roll allows you to re-roll 16.6 percent of your dice Whereas, as I said, in close combat, in shooting, it allows you to re-roll 33% of your dice. 
So there is a solid argument there for saying if you have sharpshooter, then you should be standing off and firing rather than mixing it in melee. And that's particularly true if you are a skirmisher or maybe a small or even a tiny unit. If you're only a tiny unit of riflemen, you want absolutely no part in close combat. Another time that you might want to shoot over close combat is if you are getting a bonus to your shooting. So, for instance, the Austrians, they get a bonus at close range. They get to roll an extra dice for the first time they fire at close range in the game. The British, they get to fire an extra dice the first time they fire in the game as well. But that's at any range, not just at short range. The other thing as well is you might have some support. You might have a cheeky battery of artillery nearby that can fire as well. Now, short range, when we're talking about black powder, is super short range. It's only three inches. And that means that if you're, say, the Austrians, you can march up to within three inches of the enemy blast away with four dice and you'll also get plus one to hit as well don't forget when you're firing at close range you get plus one to hit now austrians don't have any line regiments with sharpshooter baked in as standard uh, i don't think maybe they're grenzer i'm not 100 percent sure about that let me just have a look in the clash of eagles book um dum, 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 dum. Mm, no they don't so they they've got tough fighter in fact the jaegers do but not the grenzers but we'll look at later why you don't necessarily want the Jaegers in combat. So, even the Grenzer you want to get thrown in. Now, the British, they have first fire. So, they get a, an extra dice the first time they shoot. Now, some people think it's worth saving until you're at point-blank range. I don't necessarily. I would probably blaze away as soon as you can with it. But, you know, horses for courses. I wouldn't say someone was necessarily wrong for saving it. Unless they gave up four or five turns of shooting. In, in, you know, to save that one final volley, they've probably just been better off firing for the previous four turns than saving that one dice for the point-blank range shot. It can, however, provide a sneaky surprise when you are charging the second line units. That can be a little bit scary. Now, the other advantage that the British get when they are firing is if they charge... Uh, sorry, if they are charged, then they can counter-charge. So you're not even necessarily giving up the plus one to hit in close combat... By not charging so for that instance i would say of all the armies in black powder the one that can stand and shoot the best are probably the british the austrians probably a cheeky second the french i would put second to last because you're best off shooting in a line and as we many said many times before the french shouldn't be in line although <laughs> i have put them in line myself so joking aside the french don't really get any benefits or minuses for shooting unless they're leger but the worst army for doing that, by far, are the Russians. The Russians have the special rule, as Anna said earlier on. The uh, bullet is a fool, the bayonet a hero. And that means that... Oh, well, I hope she said that anyway, I don't speak Russian. And, <laughs> and that means that they get minus one to hit from their shooting. But that's balanced out by getting universal tough fighter in close combat. So for the Brits, stand and blaze away. Everyone else, probably worth getting cold steel. Now, should the Brits always stand and blaze away? Well, the answer to that is a resounding, no, monsieur, no, no, no. They shouldn't always do that. That's not always their best tactic. For the French, being in attack column is 99% of the time and charging towards the enemy, their best tactic. But again, as with the British, not always. Let's talk raw stats. Now, this is going to be a bit of a numbers-heavy section, this one, so apologies for that. But what I'm talking about here is we're going to talk about keeping your eyes on the prize, making sure that you complete the mission, and making sure that you have the resources with which to do that. So the situation is there's a British battalion fronting up against an Austrian battalion. The British have to defeat the Austrians and push through. Now, in this case, it's to get off the edge of the table, but it could be for whatever reason that you're going for. Now, the Austrians are a large regiment, battalion. Most Austrian units will be large. Not always, but usually they'll be large. So they have four stamina. Now, that's crucial. They've got four stamina, and they've got four shots and eight hand-to-hand -hand attacks. Now, for the British, he can fire, blaze away, but he cannot break that unit in one turn. It's it's mathematically impossible, unless they've already suffered casualties from before, because in order to break, you need to take an excess casualty. Now, the British are firing three dice. Let's say all three hit. Let's say the Austrians fail all three of their saves. Well, they're, they're still only taking three hits. They've got a stamina of four because they're a large battalion. Now, in close combat, the British have a factor of six. 
So, if they all hit and the Austrians fail all of their saves, then the Austrians are now two over their break point. Now, it must be said this is very unlikely that the Brits are going to get all hits on threes and then the Austrians are going to fail all their saves on fours. But it's about giving yourself the possibility in this case. You, you know, mathematically it can be proven, that you will not break an Austrian battalion in one round of shooting. You can probably say that you won't break them in two or three rounds of shooting. Although it's possible, but it's unlikely. So, you're looking at four turns. Now, if you are happy to spend four turns blazing away at those Austrians, that's fine, but you need to factor that into your battle plan and to your tactics. If the game only lasts five turns, then it's going to take too long. If the game's going to last 20 turns, well, four turns is neither here or there. But you've also got to take into account, in this instance, the Austrians actually outshoot you. They are rolling four dice a turn. Now, the British roll four dice for their first turn. Let's say they've kept their first fire bonus. So they fire four shots. And on average, they'll hit with half of them, so two hits. The Austrians will save half, so that's one casualty on the Austrians. The Austrians fire back. It's exactly the same stats. They get one as well. Now, in the next turn, the British are 50-50 whether they get a hit or not. Whereas the Austrians, on average, still get one hit. So let's say that the British got lucky. So now the Austrians have taken two hits. The Brits have taken two hits. Let's look at turn three. Well, the Brits are 50-50. Now, we gave them the benefit of the doubt last time. We won't give it to them this time because that balances out there. Now, I say they're 50-50. That's because they've got three shots. So either one or two of those will hit on average. And then if two hit, then one will go through on average because there's a 50% save. And if one of them hits, well, there's a 50% chance that none of them will go through whatsoever. So we'll say the British cause no casualties on turn three. The Austrians, again, they're firing four dice. Half of them will hit. Half of them will be saved. So one of those hits goes through. So now, despite this exchange of fire, the British are shaken. The Austrians are not. The British then, in their next turn, they're now hitting on fives. They're only going to hit once. And again, it's a 50-50. Let's say it goes through. Well, the Austrians are now on three. The Austrians fire back, they cause a casualty, and it's a break test for the British. So in this this instance, the British are going to lose a musketry duel, and that's not including the point-blank range shots for the Austrians. What I'd be tempted to do is, when the British were on two or three stamina, if I were the Austrian commander, I would order my troops forward. Remember, they can't initiative move, I don't think. I would order them forward to be within point-blank range of the enemy, and then fire from there. Hopefully that will cause the extra casualty using the extra dice that will make them roll that turn, and then you can maybe charge them in your turn, or you know do whatever it is you need to, because if you've shaken the British, then they don't get the benefit of being at point-blank range. So basically what this comes down to is don't do musketry duels if you are against a larger unit. Now, should, does that mean that the British should then assault the Austrian line? Well, let's have a look. So the Austrians get to shoot as the British come in. They're rolling four dice because they're at point-blank range, and they're hitting on threes. They're probably going to hit three times. The British are probably going to save one or two of those. So they're going in. They're going to be pretty badly mauled. And that's if we're not counting any disorders, if the Austrians manage to roll a six when they come in. Now, <laughs> I have bigged up Austrian closing fire before, and I uh, <laughs> we went live to it in a video. Uh, Dan rolled five dice for his closing fire, and he rolled four ones and a two, and that was live in one of the battle reports. I can't remember which one it was. But uh, <laughs> in general, Austrian closing fire is pretty scary. So yeah, sorry, yeah, it's five shots, isn't it? Not four. But in this instance, the British player needed to destroy that Austrian battalion, and he had to do it fast. Now, he's rolling six dice. He's hitting on threes because he's charging. Maybe hitting on fours if he's disordered, but let's say he got lucky. He's hitting on threes. That's four hits. That causes two casualties on the Austrians. That's half of their stamina in one go, or three rounds of shooting, including the first fire bonus. And they've done that in one turn. So it's sometimes worth sacrificing that first unit because the Austrians are going to absolutely pound them back. They're going to get eight dice back. They're going to hit four times. They're going to cause the two casualties. In addition to the five shots from the closing fire, that's probably going to break that British battalion. Unless they're large or guards or something like that. But it's worth sometimes throwing away that first battalion. Then next turn, you've got that reserve battalion can go in and they can smash the enemy. This is why it's important to have reserves. I would be tempted to have my reserves as Highlanders. I wouldn't put them at the front. I would have them behind the uh, the full-on hope, as it were. 
and then I would let the Highlanders come in and mop up the survivors. But certainly from my perspective as the Austrian commander in that game, every turn Dan was like, right, I'm going to shoot. I, I was happy with that. Even if he caused three hits on me and two casualties or whatever, I would still much rather he did that than he charged me. Because while he's doing that, there's no danger of him breaking my battalions. Also, the uh, falling back from shooting is a lot more friendly than falling back in close combat. So th there is also that as well. So I focus a lot on the British so far and the Austrians because I think they're the two best shooting factions in the game. If we're going to look at when should you assault, something like the Russians for argument's sake, the answer is pretty much always. Now, not necessarily. So again, if we swap out the Austrian battalion for a Russian one, I would keep firing with the Russians and that's because I don't want to risk my unit being broken. So I'm going to carry on trading fire with the British. Now, I'm not doing that to win. I'm doing that to not get the unit wiped out in a quick time. Now, despite the fact I've got a tough fighter, I'd rather trade time for lives in that case. Or should that be lives for time? Actually? So it's, it's very Russian of me. But in that case, you know, you want to hold the British off for as long as possible or whoever's trying to break through, just be there firing, blasting away. The Russians have also got excellent artillery support as well. So that helps because although you may be at minus one to hit with your musketry, you shouldn't be at minus one to hit with your artillery. And you should be running you know, pretty big guns, probably 20 pounders, something like that. Just rolling two dice even at long range. The French is a bit of a meme for me that I will always en avant with the French. Uh, vive l'Empereur, give them the bayonet, all that stuff. Joking aside though, uh, realistically you're best off being in column of attack most of the time. But it is sometimes worth forming line, trading fire, particularly if you've got a reserve that is in column. I've been meaning to do a video on Lord of Mixed for quite a while now. It doesn't work as it currently stands, but I think it could quite easily be modified to work. And it's just, just looking at the modifications for that. I may even put that in the rules pack if I get a chance to do it in time. But a French battalion in line can really help support those attacking columns behind them. They're also quite handy for taking the first fire from, say, the British, and or that first charge from the Russians. They fall back, or maybe even run away completely, and then the columns can go in and mop up the survivors of the victorious enemy. Speaking of columns, attack columns in particular, don't forget they do have a shot. Now, you know, it's not... You're fishing for a six most of the time, but you know what? When you're marching forward with those three or four, five attack columns, you got one dice each, you've got a decent chance of rolling a six and disordering that enemy battalion who's about to fire back at you. And hitting you on fives is a lot less good than hitting you on fours. So make sure that you remember that you can still trade fire a little bit with a column, but if you are in column of attack, I would suggest that what you really want to be looking at is getting into close combat as soon as possible. Finally, I just want to mention as well, there are very few battalions out there that get extra dice for shooting. We've talked about the Austrians, that's more of a, an army-wide special rule, the same with the British as well. But there are very few individual battalions that get an extra shooting dice. There are, however, individual battalions that get extra close combat dice. Such ones I'm thinking of are guard regiments or guard battalions, particularly I'm thinking like old guard or a British foot guard. These guys want to get straight in with the cold steel, even without tough fighter. Their close combat attacks, again, are degrees better than their shooting ones. With the guards, I'd certainly, uh, the British guards, I'd certainly give fire first, make sure that you use that first fire bonus, and then go in with the cold steel afterwards. One of the lucky things with the British is you very rarely have to make that decision, unless the enemy player who's doing a stalling action they're probably going to be charging you so you'll be able to get that counter charge bonus anyway if they don't charge you though i would definitely be going in if i'm fight facing a french column with a unit of british foot guard i'm going straight in i've got more attacks than them i've got the same save as them even though they are in column of attack so why not i'm hitting them on threes let's go frenchy let's see if the uh, can stand up to maitland and his guard I have to say, I've not really done a video on the British in quite a long time. It's quite nice to talk about the British. I try and avoid them because everyone does British. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's quite fun to talk about them. So we've talked about the armies that are at the top end of what they do. The Austrians, British, really good at shooting. Russians, really good at close combat. What about those sick people out there that decide that they want to take the rubbish armies? So the Neapolitans and the Spanish, for argument's sake. You know, the armies that, you know, maybe historically they're a little hard done to in the rules, but in the rules they are dreadful. What about the people who play those? 
Surely the voices in my head say you'd be better off at firing than getting in close combat with the enemy. You've only got five close combat attack dice. That's terrible. Well, I say to you, no, monsieur, get in there with the cold steel. Now, the reason why I'm saying get in there with the cold steel is these battalions have wavering. And there are some other units that have wavering as well. If your unit has wavering, get it in close combat. Now, the reason is because you are going to be taking casualties from a firefight. Now, as you said with the Austrians, they can take four. They don't care. The British can take three. The French, Russians can take four before they even think about it. If you are wavering... Every time you take a casualty, then you need to take a morale test. Now, that doesn't matter if you take one casualty that phase, or if you take 100, you've still got to take that break test. You've only got to roll a four or less, and even if you've only taken one hit, that unit is gone. So you want to minimize the number of those tests you take, and the best way of minimizing it is to maximize the number of casualties you take in one go. I know it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but if you're going to take casualties... You're best off taking him in one go and just rolling once on that table and rolling three or four times. So yes, you only have five dice in close combat. So you statistically, you're probably better off shooting. However, because of the wavering special rule, get in there, get mixing it. Now, the, the enemy may be able to do three stamina hits on you in one turn. They may not be able to. They've only got six attacks if you charge them. They're only going to hit you on average three times. You're going to probably save at least one of those, so you might get a second turn out of it. If you're standing and firing, you're probably going to take a casualty, then you're rolling on that chart. You may not break and run entirely, but you may may well fall back or do a double move backwards or something like that. So you want to try and avoid doing that. Make sure if you've got the wavering special rule, you don't get fired at too much. That's the last thing you want. And you, it may even be worth advancing behind a strong skirmish screen, and then coming out through the skirmishes and charging the enemy that way. That might be something that's worth doing. In fact, I need to put in the FAQ about charging through skirmishes. That's just reminding myself. I think that that's kind of covers when we should be cold stealing or hot leading. If you are British or Austrians, there's an argument to hot lead. Unless you need to break through the enemy, in which case cold steel. Everyone else, go with the cold steel. If you are particularly crappy, then definitely go with the cold steel. I would say this also applies to units that are perhaps not the best at shooting as well. So that would be things like Lanvia. Oh, I think Lanvia are pretty normal, aren't they, actually? But um, Opelcheni in particular, I was specifically thinking of. Get in there with the bayonet, or the pike in this case, and make a good account of yourselves. In summary, then, the armies that can get away with trading fire are the ones who either have bonuses, sharpshooter, or they have inherent army bonuses, large units, extra shot at close range, first fire, all that kind of thing. But, 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 don't think, don't be blazing away for the whole game. That just makes you better at starting that. Eventually, you're going to want to close with the bayonet. The British in particular, I think, can be, you know, they're considered to be quite a... A static army? I don't think they are. I think that's a bit of a misnomer. I think they can be very aggressive, and I think you want to be charging, particularly if you're against the clock, or you have an area that you need to clear out, so for example, say cavalry can come through, or something like that. So, do not, even if you're British, do not think that it's just lining up on a hill and shooting. You're going to be wanting to do some charging as well. If nothing else, it stops the enemy's charge bonus. The thing is with Black Powder, it comes out of Warmaster. Warmaster was designed for shooting to not be that decisive. I've been playing Warmaster quite a lot recently, actually, with my Dark Elves, and it can be quite quite good. I played against Tomb Kings recently. Shooting can be good, but very rarely is it decisive. Close combat's where it's at, and it's very similar to Hail Caesar. If you're looking at actually breaking the enemy, then get yourself in close combat, get all those dice rolled, get those six, seven, eight dice rolled, get those enemy battalions destroyed, and then move through to the next targets. Well, thank you very much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the video today. If you disagree, then please let me know in the comments down below. That's what I really like about these videos is we can, uh, you know, we, we can discuss ideas. That's, that's sort of the, the plan. There's no hard and fast rules. Now, there may not be a video next week. I am actually visiting Adepticon. So I am off to Chicago on Wednesday. So if anyone is around Adepticon, please come and say hi. If anyone wants to take me to any good pubs, then you are more than welcome to do so. However, all that said, on Sunday, I am playing the Silver Bay in it. So I may try and stream one of the games. I'm, I'm not really sure how it's going to work. I may just uh, just record 
the uh, the the event. It's three games on the Sunday, so we'll see how that one goes. But thank you very much for listening. Whether there's a video next week or not, we shall see. The week afterwards, it is British summertime comes into play. So we will start looking at doing some live streams again. They were traditionally on Wednesdays. That may change. Again, not 100% sure. I'll try and keep it on Wednesdays if I can. It just depends on what's happening at work. But there you are. Thank you very much for listening. And I'll see you guys next time.